welcome everyone. I'm Dr Nadine Levy, if I didn't say that in the first instance because there was an issue with my sound. Um, I'm the Head of Health and Social Wellbeing and I'm lucky enough to teach a number of courses here at the Nantian Institute that examine mindfulness. Mindfulness along with compassion are at the heart of both of our health programs at Nantian, which are mental health and health and social wellbeing. We take a scholarly and experiential approach here and we attempt to provide you with space and support to explore your own unique responses to the field of mindfulness studies. Throughout this lecture, I'll offer some mindful pause you can digest what you're learning and notice not only your mind's reaction to what I'm saying, but also your body's response and your emotional responses as we talk. The topic of mindfulness is highly relevant to our changing modern world with its many challenges like COVID that call for greater resilience and the capacity to meet difficult times with a sense of grace and equanimity. Mindfulness has been proven to encourage greater capacity to weather the storm of life um, and we've all been involved in some global issues recently that require greater capacity to meet these moments with some sense of strength and capacity. So I'd like to start this session with a brief grounding exercise. I'd invite you all now to drop into your body. You can close your eyes if you like. And notice what it feels like to be sitting down, whether that's on your chair or on your cushion. Notice where your body makes contact with the chair and the earth. Notice your back, notice your base, notice your feet. And you can notice the way you're seated, your posture. You might want to tuck your chin in and elongate your neck. You might want to soften your stomach and take a deep breath in. taking some time now to drop into this embodied sense as you listen to my words. Mindfully connecting with the body. What does the body feel like? So throughout this lecture, I would invite you to listen with the ears of your heart, as Tara Brack puts it, grounded in the present moment. And as I talk, take, take whatever resonates with you and feel free to let go of the rest. You can focus on the sounds as I talk and allow the content to flow through you. Today, I wanted to start by defining mindfulness. It's a term that we use a lot colloquially without really thinking about what it means. So mindfulness for our purposes today is both a practice and an outcome. It's the practice of attending to what's happening in the present, and it's something that can be practiced in daily life as well as something that can be practiced intensively through formal meditation. So mindfulness here is the outcome of being with your experience in an open, non-judgmental and flexible way. To put it simply, mindful awareness arises from intentionally paying attention in a friendly way to both external and internal experience while it's happening in real time and in real life. According to John Kabat-Zinn, who's one of the pioneers of mindfulness-based stress reduction and someone who is cited quite often in relation to secular mindfulness, mindfulness is the awareness that emerges through paying attention on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally to the unfolding of experience. Another way of thinking about mindfulness is as a way of becoming intimate with what's here, connecting with the life that we're experiencing in this very moment, whether that's good, bad or neutral. We notice the body, the feelings, sensations, and perhaps most centrally for our purposes, we notice our thoughts and our patterns of seeing the world. We notice the quality, the frequency and the texture of our thoughts. 
And mindfulness involves being aware of not only our internal self-talk, but also what we see, hear and experience in relation to what we might call the external world or the outer world as well. So noticing those around you, the natural world and how the outside world contacts our senses. So let's take a short pause now to take all that in. This time I'd like you to open up your senses and receive the sounds in your immediate environment. And spend some time noticing the sounds inside the room. Notice the sounds outside the room. And you can relate to sounds as though they're music. Appreciating the different tones and frequencies. The tempo of the sounds in the room. And as we move through this talk, stay connected to what you can hear. For many, a central aspect of mindfulness involves noticing patterns and habits of mind. And as some teachers put it, noticing your mind's best hits. Your mind might have a certain orientation, for example, a fearful orientation. You might rush to think of all the things that might be wrong in your world. Or your mind might have more of an aversive pattern of thinking that focuses on the things that are not going well in your life rather than those going right. We all have different flavours of suffering and mindfulness empowers us to identify our own and work with it skillfully. One goal in mindfulness is to develop insight and self-awareness into how the mind works so that we can begin to relate the, to these patterns in a healthy way. Before we start working with, the, with these patterns, however, we must start seeing them and seeing them clearly. We live in a culture these days that's very much hinged on the cult of busyness and mindlessness. And mindfulness in this sense can be seen as a radical move towards presence and slowing down. Here at the Nantian Institute, we provide students with the capacity to situate movements like mindfulness, both historically and socially, and to not only appreciate the fruits of these movements, but also to critique them and think about them um, critically. One such way to situate mindfulness is to consider its origins. As many of you would already know, the origins of mindfulness can be found in Buddhist philosophy. The term mindfulness is a translation of the Pali word sati. Pali is the ancient language of early Buddhism. And while there's no precise de definition of the term sati in Buddhist texts, it derives from the root word to remember. So it can be suggested that it relates to memory or recollection. However, since there's no precise word in the English language to translate sati, the closest term chosen by early translators was mindfulness. It's very plain in the early Buddhist texts that the Buddha advocated that we establish mindfulness in our day-to-day -day life. According to psychologist and Buddhist teacher Jenny Wilkes, she says the Buddhist teachings are essentially about enabling us to see our habitual tendencies more clearly, to realise how we tend to relate to our experience with clinging and aversion and to reduce the resulting suffering we cause to ourselves and others. In other words, the Buddhist aim of mindfulness is to liberate ourselves from the places we get stuck with the motivation of bringing us closer to a final place of peace and freedom not just for ourselves, but for other beings as well. Since the Buddhist time, mindfulness has been taken up in all sorts of secular contexts like healthcare, psychology and business. It's been used for thera therapeutic purposes as well to treat certain conditions like anxiety and depression. And it's been introduced in schools and to children. And there's no doubt that research in this field has exploded at Nantian, we turn our minds to the reasons why mindfulness is 
um, received such a great deal of attention in the contemporary world. One major reason is that it represents a kind of antidote to our often harried experience of modern life. Another is that it also produces good results for those who rely on their minds in their line of work, which most of us do these days. Countless studies have revealed that the capacity to keep one, one's mind focused on the present moment is associated with all sorts of benefits, like higher psychological well-being. However, at Nantian, we kind of dig deeper than that and we ask, what's the mechanism here? By attending to the moment, we're better able to see certain aspects of our experience. We're better able to see impermanence and not get so caught up in the storyline we're hooked into. And we're also able to choose our response to suffering creatively and compassionately. So at Nantian, we give you the opportunity to think deeply about how mindfulness actually works psychologically and socially. Neuroscience confirms many of these findings and reveals some very interesting additional findings about the benefits of mindfulness, namely that mindfulness increases right hemisphere activation, which is associated with happiness. Mindfulness is shown to calm the emotion regulation centers, the amygdala and the hippocampus. Mindfulness is said to encourage information to be filtered through the prefrontal lobe, yielding more conscious living. Mindfulness is said to decrease aging of the brain and mindfulness is also shown to increase cortical thickness in regions associated with attention and sensory processing. So let's just take all that information in for a moment and have a mindful pause. This time I'd like you to drop into your body again. Notice your breath. One technique we use in mindfulness practice relates to using the breath as our object for awareness. So I'd invite you now to notice the quality of your breath. Are you breathing quickly? You're breathing slowly. What is the texture of your breathing? Noticing your breath in a non judgmental way. The literature shows that there are a range of qualities that help support mindful awareness. And in many of our courses, we explore them. The first is kindness and self-compassion. As I said before, mindfulness can provide you with some space to not react, but rather respond compassionately. And at the same time, the spirit of kindness and compassion can support the cultivation of mindfulness by settling the mind and making your practice of mindfulness more sustainable. Another factor is non-judgmentalness, or in Buddhist terms, equanimity. And this involves assuming the stance of an open-minded witness in relation to your own experience. So instead of reacting to bad experience or clinging on to good experience, the invitation is in mindfulness is to just allow the river of experience to move freely through you. Another factor is patience. So understanding that in mindfulness practice, some things need to unfold in their own time. Mindfulness isn't a goal-oriented practice. It's much more process-oriented. And we let go of the destination and seek to enjoy the ride. Another factor is that of a beginner's mind. We try to orient ourselves towards the extraordinariness of the ordinary and we're willing to see things for the first time, so having a fresh perspective every time we breathe or hear a sound, receiving that with a beginner's mind. Lastly, the quality of trust is very helpful. So developing a basic trust in yourself and your feelings and also your intuition. Through mindfulness practice, the promise is that we begin to become more alive, more present in our lives instead of living robotically or on autopilot. However, mind mindfulness isn't just about reducing our own personal suffering, though it has proven to be an antidote to that. It also enables us to be present to the lives of others. 
we find that when we're present to what's going on within us, we're better able to turn up for others and work out what's skillful in the moment. We have more space within our own minds to use our brain in a way that synthesizes information and responds from that place rather than automatically. Mindfulness also is said to empower individuals to make more conscious choices about how to use their time that's in line with their values and ethics and how to benefit others in a way that is grounded in wisdom and insight. Another major benefit of mindfulness is that um, it, re- it kind of invites, I suppose, in psychological terms, emotional malleability or fluidity. So many of us have difficult moments on a day-to-day basis. We all face difficulty in our lives. We lose those we love, we lose our health, we often lose things like our job that we value. And we also get things we don't want, like a tricky diagnosis or a new unexpected challenge. And mindfulness has actually been proven to produce greater capacity to meet these challenges and not get stuck in rumination about what such experiences mean about who we are or the fact that we've failed at life somehow. So a strong practice in mindfulness might empower us to feel strong negative emotion, not repress the emotion, but feel the emotion, but then to let it go. It doesn't necessarily linger or become another pattern of thinking, nor does it stick to our sense of self. We also know that mindfulness supports our capacity for focus, productivity and creativity, and to become better leaders. In fact, in our health and social wellbeing program at the moment, we've now got a new subject called Mindful and Compassionate Leadership that starts very soon and that delves deep into this particular area. One of the ways we study mindfulness in both of our health programs is through analysing its application and capacity to contribute to the health and wellbeing of people in diverse settings including clinical, health, work, educational, social and community settings. We know that a range of programs like Mindful Self-Compassion, Mindful and Cognitive Behavioural Therapy and Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction have been rolled out in both clinical and non-clinical settings. And in our health degrees, which include a mental health degree and health and social wellbeing, we develop the skills to critically analyse such initiatives and to make recommendations based on evidence about the usefulness of mindfulness in our communities. Centrally as well, as students of health at Nantien, um, you learn to develop your own mindfulness practice and deepen it and develop the capacity to reflect and strengthen your own learnings in a way that's safe, supported and contemplative. This brings me to the end of my talk. I'd like to end by inviting you all to reconnect with an embodied presence. I'm going to ring the bell and close your eyes and listen to the sound of the bell. Thank you all for your kind attention.